Are you ready to turn your best ideas into a thriving online business? Introducing Shopify, your no excuses business partner. You might not realize, but our podcast, More Than Mammies, it's a business. And we started it, of course, to talk about maternity, not to become an e-commerce expert. So yeah, we needed some help selling our merch and getting our store up and running. Another sale. Shopify is a commerce platform revolutionizing millions of businesses worldwide. No matter if you are a garage entrepreneur or a big business, Shopify is the only tool you need to start and grow your business without the struggle. With Shopify single dashboard, you can manage orders, shipping, and payments from anywhere, giving you the insights you need wherever you are. Sign up for $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash sonoro or lowercase. Go to shopify.com slash sonoro to take your business to the next level today. Shopify.com slash sonoro. Welcome to episode 43 of the Brown and Black podcast. My name is Jack Rico. And I'm Mike Sargent. And every week we take a look at race and pop culture through a brown and black lens. This episode, we bring you an exclusive interview with Dr. Barner Hesse, the creator of the much talked about eight white identities that has rattled right wing media personalities such as Megyn Kelly and Ben Shapiro. Dr. Hesse is an associate professor of African-American studies, political science and sociology at Northwestern University, who received a Ph.D. in government ideology and discourse analysis at the University of Essex in England. In his first ever U.S. interview, Dr. Hesse breaks down each of the eight white identities and the origins of how they came to be. He also explains to us the formation of race, the history of black political thought, and amongst many other topics, why he has never given an interview to an American media outlet until now. One of the things I want to warn our audience before they even listen to the interview is that this is something that requires some concentration and it requires you to pay attention because it is, in my opinion, very dense, dense in that there are a lot of layers to it. You could listen to this interview two and three and four times, I think, and get a lot out of it. One of the things we had to do here to really to get you to be able to digest this was break it into parts. We're going to play part two on the next show. But we've broken up the first part of the interview into two parts where he gives us a setup to understand the kind of work that Professor Hesse does. And then we lead you into not only how this work has been taken, but where it led him to go in creating what is now known as the eight white identities. If you've been paying attention to right-wing media over the last month and a half, one of the things that has jumped out is something called the eight white identities. It's a heuristic that breaks down the eight white identities that perhaps you didn't even know existed until it was broken down so well. The reactions, of course, from people of color that I know have been enthusiastic. They think it's brilliant, just like Jack and I do. But that's not how right-wing media sees it. As a matter of fact, here's a clip of some of the things that have been said about the eight white identities. There's a, a public school on the Upper East Side of Manhattan that just got in the news because they gave out this panoply of eight categories into which all white people fall. And on the one end is white supremacist, and on the other end is... Um, It was white trader, basically, um, white abolitionist. And they're really encouraging you to be more of a white trader. It's like everybody gets divided into oppressed or oppressor, right, on racial identity, on sexual identity. I mean, this is really damaging. And as you get older, what the studies show is these sort of implicit biased ed education uh, efforts bring out racism. So if somebody's having racist thoughts in the back of their head, it brings it to the frontal lobe and, and more people act on their latent racism than they otherwise would have. 
Lorna Hesse, welcome to Brown and Black. Thank you very much. I'm very pleased to be here. Just to introduce people to what it is that you do, you teach in a department called the Humanities, and that should speak for itself, but what is a political theorist? Well, the first thing I should say is uh, I, I teach in the Department of African American Studies, which is part of a wider humanities and social science environment. But a political scientist is a thinker, an academic who investigates and thinks about how societies work together as a set of laws and a set of rules to create some kind of bounded community in which the relationships continually bring up social issues about how we ought to live together. So a political theorist would examine things like equality, liberty, democracy, justice, uh, liberalism, socialism, all kinds of ideas that have been debated and contested in communities that build societies organized around the principle of how we can live together, particularly how do we live with people who are not like us? This is always the perennial kind of question that uh, is uh, foregrounded in political theory. Um, well, now I want to go that a little further, uh, and, and I'm sure Jack has a question, but when we spoke prior to this, you talked about that you specialize in studying black political thought. Now, that's a phrase, just those three words together, I had not really, cons you know, I had not really put that together that way. But what do you mean when you say black political thought beyond maybe just the obvious? Well, as they say in all the great interviews, I'm glad you asked me that question. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I mean, if you think back to what I've just said about political theory, I've described things that sound universal, justice, liberty, uh, democracy, liberalism, freedom, and so on. And they are presented to us as universal. These are usually ideas that are seen as the building blocks of the modern world. But the modern world wasn't simply built through these high ideals. It was built with uh, values and developments that seem to work against or subvert or contradict these ideals. So if you think about the experience of black people brought into the modern world through slavery, from the point of slavery in the 16th century right up until the 21st century, you've seen so many different kinds of struggles and so many different kinds of ideas mobilizing black communities politically. So what black political thought does is to try and look at two things. On the one hand, what are the conditions out of which black social movements and political movements emerged, which give a very different picture of the world than the dominant Western ideas we get? So let me give you an example. If in traditional political theory, there is a study of capitalism, well, in black political thought, this, we would look at capitalism and slavery together. If in traditional political theory, there's a study of liberalism, black political thought, we would look at liberalism and colonialism together because these things developed deeply entangled together. If in traditional political theory, there's an examination of the history of modern democracy, we would look at the relationship between modern democracy and white supremacy because these two things developed deeply together. And if you think about those things that develop deeply together, that's what ruptures and that's what creates the discrepancies and the impressions in the black experience against which movements emerged. So on the other hand, if we're thinking about the movements amongst black populations, black political thought would look at that whole range across 500 years, what Cedric Robinson calls the black radical tradition from anti-slavery and anti-colonialism, right into pan-Africanism and black feminism, into civil rights and Black Lives Matter. So all of that making of the modern world would be the arena in which black political thought operates. Barner, uh, we were talking about education. Um, 
And a lot of this has to do with a big uh, article that came out with Mark Fetterman of the principal of uh, Eastside Community High School that gave this pamphlet of the eight white identities. Obviously, he had his reasons to give this out. He had reasons that he felt that white parents should see this. How do we fix those problems in the educational system where black political thought is really not a part of the curriculum in any way? Uh, none of what you've been saying is really taught at schools from kindergarten all the way probably to senior year in high school. How do we fix the, 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 the major problem of the educational system in the United States to talk to us accurately about the black history, about Latino history, about the history of people of color in this country? Well, I think, you know, that, I mean, that's a huge question. I'm mm. two questions in and already I'm being asked <laughs> to fix the educational system. I mean, you didn't warn me in advance. But I, I, you, I, uh, you didn't put your cape on either. I'm uh, no, I didn't. I just feel like I picked up the kryptonite. But um, I think the, when you pose a question like that, the, the idea of fixing a system automatically makes it political. Mm. And when I say it makes it political, it means that it uh, it offers a challenge in people's social lives in various different parts of the society, in various different institutions. So this is not simply an issue for an institutional system of education. This is also an issue for things like book publishing, movie making, mm. demo uh, uh, sort of documentary making. Um, political discourse? How do we talk about the past? So if you take, for example, just a very simple thing like freedom, and you place it in the context of, say, how politicians talk about the emergence of the United States as a land of freedom. Well, if you continually say something like, you know, the U.S. is and always was a land of freedom, while not at the same time saying the U.S. for the greater part of its time period has been a land of freedom plus slavery plus colonial settler society putting Native Americans on reservations plus Jim Crow plus freedom, unless in all of the institutions of society there's a reckoning with the way in which some of the most valued values emerged with some of the most uh, repressive kinds of ideas, unless there's a reckoning with that in all spheres of cultural production and knowledge production, it's quite a lot to place that burden solely on schools or even on universities. There has to be some kind of social movement around the transformation of knowledge in lots and lots of places. Well, you know, you're, you're making what I think is a very strong point because when you say in the educational system, that sounds like a specific thing, uh, as opposed to, let's just say, our system of education, meaning how we learn what we learn. Most yes. people get their opinions from somebody else, from yeah. a commentator, uh, you know, an editorial. That's where they get their opinions. If, if it strikes a chord with them on, and, and, you know, uh, it already ties in with things they've already thought, then yeah, that's, that's not just, that's not just a, a belief or an opinion that's fact and that's how they learn it. So to me also, one of the things that you're, you're touching upon here is um, not only how we're taught, but, and what we're taught, but what it feels like to, let's just say, have been analyzed and decided upon. So very often, people of color, you know, Latinos have had to constantly redefine themselves. You know, the latest way, you know, you may not say Hispanic, but okay, there's Hispanic, there's Chicano, there's, you know, okay, Latinx, let's cover it all. Same thing with, oh, we were Negro, okay, then we're Blacks, and then, all right, we're African American. But white people, I don't think, have really had their identities broken down in the way that, not in the way that you have, but I don't think they've had themselves kind of broken down the way we have. I mean, can you speak to that a, a little bit? Sure. I think um, it's, it's a really odd thing actually speaking to the issues that you raise because you realize that 
uh, it's rare for something like this to be the focus of conversation. But when we say things like, you know, the U.S. emerges out of colonialism and slavery, one of the things we often forget is how knowledge and classification systems were produced under colonialism and racial slavery. So the U.S., just to take one example of nations in the Americas, you could say the same about Brazil, you could say the same about Cuba, you could say the same about um, Argentina. White populations became the populations that were sovereign. And as part of their sovereignty over the landmass, over the populations that were colonized and enslaved, that carried with it the capacity to name everything around them, to name the landmass, to name the people. This is part of exercising control. This is part of exercising white authority. And not only naming, but introducing ideas uh, called race and practices where populations are classified and white people are placed in the hierarchy above these other populations. So you find that over this period of time, the populations so named find themselves often struggling against how they've been defined, how they've been demonized, how they've been named, how they've understood, wanting to name themselves and understand themselves. Meanwhile, the society in which that's working its way through is one that institutionally preserves the dominance and the authority and the sovereignty of whiteness that can only be represented in the way that white people choose to represent themselves. So part of the position of power is your power to name and to define other people. Mm. Is your power to interrogate them is your power to look upon them without them looking back at you and describing what they see. It's one of the reasons why today, when we talk about racial profiling, white people can't be racially profiled. I mean, of course they can, but of course they can't, right? <laughs> we know they can't, right? Even though it's theoretically possible that they can, because the cultural and political force and thrust of the society has always been the institutions to focus on interrogating non-white populations, particularly black populations. So to turn that around in even a slight way can become unsettling. It's a little bit like a lot of black people have the experience, particularly black women, where other uh, women, uh, particularly white women, or even white men want to touch the texture of their hair because it's different. Imagine the other way around. Mm. Black, can I touch your hair? And this is just unacceptable. But what you're finding in this, you know, that desire to touch is in the culture, in the individual culture of a white citizen, is this idea that I can interfere with you. I can interrogate you. I can touch you. I can probe you. I can profile you. I can question you. So when we turn to the eight white identities, it becomes a shock. It becomes a shock to the system in which the last 500 years has involved white academics and legislators and political elites documenting, researching, analyzing non-white populations. In fact, there's an academic discipline called anthropology. Anthropology in university departments is predicated on research into non-white populations. It would be staggering if somebody said, I wanted to research a white population. Yeah. And if that person was African or Asian or so on, it would be staggering. Why would it be staggering? Because it's challenging existing power relations. So I think that's part of what was unsettling, this idea that white people are not simply normal people, but they do have activities that can be studied and analyzed as white identities. Before we get into the breakdown of the eight white identities, Barner, I wanted to talk to you about the formation of race. There's a, there's, 
there, there's scientific fact that race actually doesn't exist, that it was a social construct uh, that was created. Now, a lot of Spaniards, when they were in Mexico in Nueva España, um, they created a caste system. And Isabel Wilkerson has spoken about this in her book, uh, Cast. Um, when you think about race and the way we use race in our language in America, where does race actually come from when we speak about race? Well, there's two ways usually you can research the history of something. You can research how something has been spoken about. And you can also research how something was done, even though it wasn't captured in the words that spoke about it. Okay? So we can, we can you know, we, you and I could create something we've never seen before, before we actually name it. You know, we could, I've created this new form of music. I don't even know what it's called yet, but it exists. And right. then maybe after a while we name it. Every form of music emerges that way. It doesn't emerge with the name. So when historians and political theorists look at the emergence of race, there's a couple of things we see right away. Firstly, this modern idea of race, we know emerges in the colonial conquest of the Americas from the late 16th century onwards, which includes the development of racial slavery. So what you're seeing in that context is a whole range of European Christians coming into the Americas and beginning to mark themselves off as distinct from, as, as, as cultural specimens, as religious people, as people with economic and political powers, to mark themselves as distinct from the populations who are enslaved that they call Negro, the populations that are conquered that they call Indians. So what you're getting is the creation of racial categories through the experience of the colonial imposition and the imposition of slavery. And these racial categories are basically breaking down into those populations that are seen as European in terms of their heritage, in terms of their religion, in terms of their politics, in terms of their economic interests and technology and so on, and those populations that are seen as non-European. And as we move into the 17th and the 18th century, that, that distinction gets color-coded as white and non-white. And what you're seeing is this racial distinction, every time it's mentioned, is also deeply uh, based in unequal relations of power, politically, economically, culturally, territorially, and so on. So what I argue is that the racial categories that we see come out of the colonial domination of the world by the Europeans who came to describe themselves as white and then describe everyone else in a different color who were mostly colonized and enslaved by virtue of not being white. So even when you get to the caste system in Spanish colonial America, this idea that there are so many distinctions and divisions because of mixture between the so-called races, two things we should bear in mind. Those mixtures take place within the extremes of white on the one hand and absolutely non-white, particularly black on the other. And it's those racial categories that hold in place all the debate about the nuances. But one final thing to say about it, one of the reasons that we get confused, it seems to me, around this idea that race is a biological or scientific category is because by the time we get to the late 19th century, the 1800s, there's a movement in the West to uh, investigate what it is that makes different populations different. And one of the things that these scientists, these anthropologists, these you know, early sort of biologists as they will become, one of the things that they take for granted that the populations around the world 
who are already colonized and placed in inferior positions, that somehow the position, the reason for their inferior positions has something to do with their bodies rather than something to do with the colonial powers that put them in those positions. So what you end up with is science, scientizing, biologizing colonial categories, which is why I say to my students, if you see somebody from a different racial group, when you look at their ancestry, you're not looking at biology, you're looking at colonialism. Wow. The colonial ancestry tells you how you arrive at the position that you're in and why a particular non-white skin creates the kinds of experiences that you have. Fourth level. This is all this is all cult crap, by the way. This is just cultic nonsense. Fourth level. Okay, now we are rising. So we went from the worst and we're, we're moving toward the best. Get ready for it, gang. Fourth, white benefit. You're sympathetic to a set of issues, but only privately. You won't speak or act in solidarity publicly because benefiting through whiteness in public. Some people of color are in this category as well. So this would be like Candace Owens. So if you're a black person, but you don't speak in or act in solidarity with whiteness in public, uh, or, or against whiteness in public, this means that you're of white benefit. Actually, according to these folks, Candace is probably a, a white supremacist, maybe a white voyeurist. Okay, this is the crap they are teaching to school children. It's racist nonsense. There should be lawsuits on the basis of this. Getting picked up by right-wing media, you said this has happened to you before. I'd like to know your thoughts on why you're getting such a strong reaction, and then you have to give us the origin of how this came to be. <laughs> yeah, how did you first hear about it? Yeah, yeah. Right. Like, how, how did you? Because yeah, tell us about you and your relationship with right-wing media, because they love you. Mine, complete. <laughs> well, let, let's not overstate the case. You know, I know it sounds better if you put it that way, but I don't think I'm so loved. There's uh, bigger fish than me to fry. Um, I think that, uh, so the thing about the eight white identities, and um, this is something that people can Google, just type in eight white identities and it will come up. The origin story is important because I was teaching a class at Northwestern University called Unsettling Whiteness, which is really about how do we understand whiteness and in many of the ways that I've described as a system of power relations, as a system of cultural formations and, and, and political identities. If we take it seriously, how do we study that? And at the end of that course, in the very last class, I was thinking to myself, well, I don't want to leave the students with this idea that white identity is this uniform, unchanging, monolithic thing that can, can, can never be transformed or never go in a different direction. So I started to think about the literature and uh, see what's been written. And I began to realize that there were a number of ways we could talk about white identity. And I picked out eight different ways of doing it because I thought that would illustrate an interesting range that would enable us to show how in different ways and at different times, sometimes separately, sometimes in combination, you could, I, you could specify eight white identities that on the, one, on the one hand, three of them, for example, generally endorsed and supported racism in different kinds of ways. And then on the other hand, five of them on this, in, this, on, in this example, uh, opposed or challenged racism. So that was the eight white identities. I did the lecture and then I forgot about it. In fact, I didn't actually have any intention of bringing it up in any of the courses when I went and taught the course again. Now, what year was this? What year was this? 2013. So that was just, for me, a one-off. Um, but a student who was in the class was particularly taken with and inspired by 
this, what I call a heuristic. And she put it on her Tumblr account at the time. And I came across it when I was getting these, uh, you know, notifications from neo-Nazis and I was going on the website and seeing myself racially abused and all of that. Once it was on, we couldn't pull it back. Now, once it began to circulate, it was circulating in the form that the student had written down my lecture in her lecture notes, in her sentence construction, in her half phrases to make the point, not my, if I'd like to put it this way, not in my beautifully spoken prose. Okay, I've said it. So it circulates for all these years and it's getting picked up by lots of people, people in Canada, South Africa, Australia, the UK, commending me, telling me this is great, this is a powerful instrument, I can use it for training and education. Uh, one guy in New York was asking me, I have an art gallery, can I show it as an exhibit in my gallery? Organizations, can I redesign the aesthetic pres presentation? And asking me permission. And every year it seemed to go viral. I'd be on Twitter and I'd be like, oh, here he goes again. And, it, and I was bemused. I thought it was interesting. I didn't think it was particularly profound, but people were responding to it. And I'm thinking, I don't want to be known as the eight white identities guys, but you know, I didn't know what was in the future. Until this year, I discovered it when I noticed a lot of Twitter chatter on my account about the eight white identities and people were telling me it was blowing up, which is when I closed and locked my Twitter account. And it took off from there. And I think it took off from there particularly because there is a particular zeitgeist in the US at the moment around some kind of deep feeling of threat to the dominance and the authority of whiteness, particularly educationally and politically and culturally. And of course, there's an organized conservative movement that looks at moments that it can catalyze as latest developments in the culture wars. And I got caught up in that. Barner, knowing all this, why haven't you spoken out to defend it? There's a lot of people in the press, publicists, crisis publicists, they all talk about this. <clears throat> it's better to just talk to someone, one, one interview, I guess, before this one uh, on television. You could have gone on Fox News and say, hey, listen, this is what I know. This is how I feel about it. And if you don't like it, then, then fine. But you have not given one single interview until this moment. Why is that? Well, uh, there's a number of reasons. I mean, you know, you could have gone on Fox News. Doesn't sound appetizing to me. Um, you know, I could have gone and eaten the dog's dinner, but <laughs> I didn't choose to do it. And um, what I thought was, on the one hand, I wanted to see how this was playing out. And I really wanted to see what people were saying. In fact, I even found myself at times when people were writing me hostile emails, if they did not racially abuse me, I would enter into conversation with them to find out and to try and understand what was going on. And when I started to look at the media, I found that the closer that people examined the eight white identities, the less able they appeared to be to shout shock and horror. I mean, on the one hand, are you going to say these things don't exist? Well, nobody said they didn't exist. Nobody says a white supremacist identity doesn't exist or, you know, a, a white voyeurism identity doesn't exist. Maybe they got troubled about the labels or the terms. But it seemed to me once you got into how and why did, uh, you know, a heuristic of eight white identities come into being, you would need to have a proper venue to have that conversation, which enabled it to be educational rather than sensational. So all these invitations from, you know, conservative media to discuss and get into some kind of uh, violent conflict through conversation 
simply didn't appeal to me. I don't think I would have had the opportunity to say as much as I've said in this podcast so far. Well, I appreciate that. And we are extremely glad that you chose us. Now, we've been talking about it for a while. And, uh, you know, I would say eight out of 10 people I've spoken to have heard about this. But there are definitely some people who have not. Uh, Would you be so kind as to break down those eight white identities for us? Because I feel, (laughs) I mean, I could read them, but I think you'd be better reading them. Right. This is the moment I've not been waiting for. Um, <laughs> and wait, before you read them, yeah. uh, I was teasing you. I was calling it, ah, where do you fit in the HESI spectrum? And you were like, don't say that. Because you yeah. said it's not a spectrum, it's a hierarchy. Can you explain the difference between the two? Yeah. I love the way when I say don't say that, you come back and just say <laughs> I'm getting used to your style now. So... um So let me do this. I mean, you know, I've been with this for so long. It's sort of like, you know, uh, you know, uh, it's like people asking Stevie Wonder to sing Superstition. I don't know how many times he's sung it, but (laughs) here we go again. Um, So what we have with these, this eight white identities, I'll go through them very, very quickly, is I wrote it as a list and I saw it as a hierarchy. But I noticed when it gets consumed by people in the wider world, they see it as a spectrum. So as I go through it, I'll say why I see it as a hierarchy. So this idea of identity needs to be distinguished from people. So this is not a typology of people. Mm. This is a, you know, a list of identities that people can take up or people become positioned in relation to, right? You can take up an American identity in lots of different ways. You can take up a Christian identity in lots of different ways, and so on. You can take up a white identity in lots of different ways. And I point out eight different ways that have existed historically and one can see sociologically. The first one, white supremacy, shouldn't be too difficult to understand. And in fact, you know, let me back up a little bit. I should say, of course, that the U.S. invents white identity, okay? Mm. And it legalizes the idea of white identity in 1790 when it introduces the first naturalization law. And in that naturalization law, it says that only white people can be citizens. So without a white identity, you cannot be a citizen under the 1790 naturalization law. When you get to the Civil War, one of the things we notice in the Civil War is that the conflict is between two different kinds of white identity. A white identity that's defending slavery and a white identity that's against slavery. I haven't invented white identity, nor have I invented more than one white identity. That's historically there. So what do you do as an academic? You begin to analyze these developments and you ask yourself the question, is it simply two white identities? We know there were a white identity that was for civil rights for African-Americans, and we know there was a white identity that was against civil rights for African-Americans. Well, from the 1960s onwards, it seems to me that this has expanded into more nuanced, different kinds of white identity. So we always will have white supremacy. This is the identity that sees itself as dominant and masterful and as representing everything else in the nation. So if you think about something like democracy and citizenship, and you think about citizens in relationship to democracy, the most powerful and supreme citizens in the US are white citizens. Because even now, only white citizens can decide if and when structural racism will ever be tackled. If white citizens came together and said, we want to tackle structural racism, it gets done. No other citizen composition has that power. So that tells you something about what white supremacy looks like in relation to citizenship. That hasn't changed in over 300, 400 years. White citizens abolished slavery set up Reconstruction, set up Jim Crow, 
abolish Jim Crow. And it's all done at the level of who has mastery. And also remember, it was white citizens, they gave black citizens citizenship. Who giveth can also taketh away. So white identity, number one, is white supremacy. White voyeurism is the kind of white identity that breaks with this notion that I want to be completely segregated from black people culturally, because it's deeply invested in knowing and understanding and finding pleasure in and viewing black culture. And you see this kind of white identity clearly in the history of black music in the US, from blues to jazz, to rock and roll, to hip hop, right? You see a lot of investment in black music and identifying with black people culturally and musically, but not identifying necessarily with black people socially and politically. It's voyeuristic because we're looking at black people from afar in terms of their physical human dispositions, but we're keeping them close as pleasurable objects of consumption. White privilege as an identity is, you know, the identity that is not completely invested in the overall dominance of supremacy, but assumes that the world consists of white people and non-white people. And that's basically how you see the world. And you see the world from that point of view. It assumes that the values and the histories of white people are the standard, are the norm. And in that context, you can have diversity. You can have people who are involved in the norms set by white people. You can have people who are involved in the institutions that are organized and defined by white people. White benefit. This is a kind of identity that tends to, um, you know, consider speaking out against injustices or recognizing aspects of, of racism, but doesn't really want to do so because it benefits from how things are. So this is where you might have police officers or athletes who could speak out against injustice that they see, but choose not to because their careers are deeply sedimented in the structures that are upholding some of these injustices. They benefit from it. The white confessional identity. This is, you know, again, there's a kind of recognition of injustice and inequalities. Not quite sure about whether we want to do something about this, but we want to display our solidarity with black people, with Latinos, with Asians. And often we find ourselves, and you see corporations doing this a lot, apologizing for things that have happened. We will never do this again. We didn't realize that our advertising had these racially charged implications. There's a, an attempt to change things, not necessarily following through, but making some impact, not necessarily making a great impact, uh, but keeping you know, black people, minorities, Asian people on side. The white critical, as we're moving now closer to the challenging of racism, uh, describes those individuals and organizations that begin to see a critique of the society and they signal their critical disposition and attitude by avoiding terms like, you know, watered down terms like prejudice and bias. And they start making use of terms like racism and structural racism and white supremacy and institutional racism. And you see this a lot amongst um, artists and writers and, and filmmakers. You know, I give, you know, for, for example, Ken Burns, the film, the documentary filmmaker, you would see him in this white critical field. You could also place um, uh, Damon Lindelof, the writer and creator of the Watchmen HBO series, you know, beginning to have a more critical attitude to the cultural formation of the U.S. Now, the last two white identity categories is where a lot of controversy emerges. So number seven is white trader. I must emphasize, I did not invent that term. 
that's been in the literature since the 1990s, when a lot of early sort of critical white studies literature emerged. And the idea of the white trader was really about identifying those white identities taken up by people in institutions and organizations when they can see that their colleagues have been witness to or have perpetrated some kind of racial injustice and they refuse to close ranks with those people. They break ranks. It's a little bit like having a juror on the grand jury and the grand jury consists only of white jurors and they see improprieties and inappropriate behavior and they decide to speak out and not simply say, I'm going to fold myself into my white community. You are a traitor to injustice. You are a traitor to uh, concealing inequality. And that's what that means. And then the white abolitionist is really, it comes from the long history of abolition against slavery. If you were to really place it in that lineage, then you would recognize that the white people who were involved in abolitionism with black people were a very different kind of uh, identity formation or taking up a very different kind of identity than the white citizens who wanted to preserve slavery. So abolition was really about how do we dismantle and get rid of the system that sustains slavery. The problem with abolition in the past was that it seemed that there was always an assumption that if you get rid of slavery, you'll get rid of the system of race. But that's not what happened. The system of race remained, slavery was abolished, and race morphed into white supremacy, institutionalized and legalized, and institutional racism. So this idea of white abolitionism is about abolishing white institutions that rest on the authority of structural racism and white supremacy. That's it for this 43rd episode of Brown and Black. We'd like to thank Dr. Barner Hesse for being on the show. And if you would like to support this podcast, please subscribe and leave a review. Your help will allow us to be heard by many more people. This episode was edited by Joshua Tirado. Next week, we will bring you part two of our exclusive interview with Dr. Barner Hesse. We'll talk to you next time on another episode of Brown and Black.